Well, today we're doing a bit of, a bit of Bible prophecy. Now, before we start, I just want to read one verse out of um, 2 Peter chapter 1. And it says here, We have also the more sure word of Bible or prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Now, prophecy here, it says, is given as a light in a dark place. So it's one of those things that it's good to be aware of aspects of Bible prophecy because they're very good at demonstrating that God, who is the God of the universe, who tells, you know, the Bible says in Isaiah, that it says, the God says, you know, I am God, there is none else, but declaring the end from the beginning. God does this for a reason so that we can then go out and use that as a light for people who are in darkness to show them that our God is God. And he does it with us individually, but also does it um, with Bible prophecy so that we can then go out and help people. So I'm hoping that the information you're going to see today, I know you won't be able to capture it all, but we're videoing it, and it's a really interesting topic in the scriptures. We've talked about the uh, prophecies of Daniel before, but this is probably going to be a little bit different than you've seen before, and um, hopefully be useful to you. Who was Daniel? Daniel was uh, one of the four great prophets. Now, four, four great prophets from the Bible talks about that. We're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So Daniel, not once through the book of Daniel, was called a prophet. And I was remarking to Julie yesterday, it's interesting that um, the way in which these people prophesied, uh, three of those prophets prophesied openly, and a lot of his prophecies came through interpretation. So there, in those four great prophets, we see, uh, we see in the group of this, we have prophecy and interpretation. Uh, and it's an interesting aspect as well. Most people are aware of Daniel mostly through the uh, Daniel and the Lion King, but it's also where he interpreted the writing on the wall of Belshazzar the, the king, and also he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the, of the great image. Uh, and there are a couple, few of the um, highlights of Daniel's time, but what we're going to look at today is a dream that Daniel actually had about four beasts, or a succession of beasts that would arise upon the earth. Uh, his life and his prophecies are recorded in, recorded in the book of Daniel. He was descended from one of the noble families of Judah and was born in Jerusalem around about 623 BC. Okay. The other main character in this book is a fellow by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was king of Babylon, as best known as the king who conquered Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, and carried away the people of the Jews captive to Babylon. Of all of the heathen monarchs mentioned by name in the scriptures, Nebuchadnezzar is the most prominent and the most important. The prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and the last chapters of Kings and Chronicles are centered around his life. So he's pretty significant in terms of the Bible story. And here you can see this image here is the, is the um, dream that he had. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream in chapter 2 of Daniel. And what we're going to be looking at today is a similar dream that Daniel had, but rather than a golden image with a gold head and silver body and uh, bronze midsection and, uh, and so forth, we've got the animals here in different species. Now, this is a bit of a chart put together just to, I guess, help put all this together. What we're going to do, rather than using, usually when we talk about Daniel, we start in Daniel and we just go through from Daniel to Revelation and look at the outlining story. But I was, I was thinking about why Babylon was so prominent. Why begin with Babylon with these succession of empires? I mean, there are other empires before Babylon, or other nations. You know, what's the classification of a, an empire and so forth? And I went back to Genesis and began the story back in Genesis to give us a bit of foundation, a bit of understanding. That, you see the story of Adam. Adam had Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, and Cain was cast out, and he went off and built a city called Enoch. Now that city, Enoch, eventually the name became Unuk, and then was changed, well, not really changed, it was just adapted to the language of the time to be called Uruk, all the same place. So if you look in the encyclopedia or the history books and look up the city of Enoch, Unuk, or Uruk, they're all the same place, just different names. 
And so we take a call, we're talking about Enoch, the city of Enoch, not the person Enoch who was uh, in the Old Testament. In Genesis 6 uh, uh, through 7, talks about the flood, and then uh, chapter 10 talks about a fellow named Nimrod, and chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. But Cain, and he's uh, when he went to set the city up, there was an establishment in this city of a religious concept which was basically Baal worship. They worshipped the sun and the moon. And that was very prominent in Babylon. And what we're going to see throughout this story is that the, the city of Babylon really was founded, the foundation was built in this area here. By, by when Cain was cast out of the garden and it established a city. Adam and Eve also had another son called Seth. And he, through that line came Noah and Shem and Japheth. Through his line came Askenaz. Now, over in Russia today, they would say that the, the Jewish population of Russia, about 95% of those are what they call Askenazi Jew, or descended from Askenaz. So, they're a Japhetic Jew. So 95% of the world's Jewry would be classified as Ashkenazi Jews, not a, so they're from Jacob, not Shem. So when we talk about the term Semitic, it's actually a misnomer. Most of the Jewish people in the world today are actually descended from Jacob, and they're not Semitic at all. Shem's, a, Shem's descendant was Abraham, through which we had uh, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes and so forth. And anyway, we're going to be concentrating just mostly on the red section today. I don't want to get sidetracked onto the other section we're going to do that later on in the year. <coughs> going back to Adam and Eve, look here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, if you feel like, like me, why the significance of this tree of knowledge? And I'm putting to you here is that Eve from that tree of knowledge, Eve, what she is doing, and Adam, are in effect saying that they are able to take in of that, the, that knowledge of good and evil, make the distinction between right and wrong, and choose to do right. That's what they're proposing to God by eating that fruit. They're saying, I can eat this fruit, I can have the knowledge of good and evil, and I can handle it. And what God is saying to them here is that if you eat this fruit, then you won't be able to cope with the consequences of it. And we haven't. We haven't been able to cope with this consequence of having the knowledge of good and evil. We haven't been able to deal with it. So what has happened as a result of this is that the predominant world religions today are what we would classify as ethical humanism. In other words, man determines truth. For the Muslims, they write a book of law, and if they keep those laws to, to the standard, then they will have the reward. Jews, the same. They keep the law, and they will be saved by virtue of them keeping those laws. And the same with the Hindus, and, the, and most of the Christian religions, unfortunately, have gone down the same road. It's the salvation of works, which is really where they are stuck themselves now. The main view, ethical humanism is just saying, that, they are, that we are able to determine our own ability to be with God, determined by our actions or our ability to keep our works. Genesis chapter 4, we go down a little bit further. I'm, I'm building a bit of a story here, but you'll see where I'm going, going with it as we go through. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. Now, the standout point to me is that what Cain has offered here are works of his hands, as opposed to what Abel offers, which is the first fruits. The actual word there is the same word as birthright. In other words, Cain is offering something that he can do for God, and Abel is offering something that God has done already by, um, you know, God created that animal. Very good difference. And what happened, we all know the story, Cain killed Abel eventually. But when, um, when God was displeased with Cain, and 
Cain was upset about this. We read in verse 7, just here, right? <coughs> if you do well, thou shalt not, shalt thou not be accepted. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Which is a little bit hard to read in King James. So I looked at the Amplified. It says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin crouches at your door, its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now, to me, that's a bit of a warning. That if we go along the lines of thinking that our salvation is a function of our works, by pleasing God through how good we can be, then we are putting, making a rod for our back. And we're giving ourselves a burden that we can't cope with. And this is what God is explaining to Cain. And then, Cain gets angry, goes and kills his brother. Verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, Cain's, Cain's um, punishment, killing his brother, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So, as you can see, he studied it for yourself, the Uru, uh, a study of the uniform scene, uh, soon revealed that this could equally be pronounced Uru, which is uh, recognised at once by Sage, who's an archaeological historian, uh, and many others, as identical with the biblical word Enoch. So we see here, this place here, is where Cain was cast out to, the city of Enoch. Archaeologists have said uh, that this city is the oldest archaeological dig on earth of the city. They estimate that there was around about 50,000 people living in this city. A little bit later, Genesis chapter 10. This is Nimrod now, another person. In the interim, what's happened is the flood has come, destroyed all of those people, they say, descendants of Cain, and now a descendant of Ham. Noah had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Ham had a son, and his name was Cush, and he begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty hunter, in a, a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, Achab, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Out of, the land, out of that land went forth Asher and built Nineveh and Rehoboth uh, and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. Now, this city here, Erech, down here, again, it's the same place. And it's in this place, Erech, is this massive mound that they call a Diggerah, that they believe may have been the Tower of Babel of Biblical. So we're seeing a bit of, just to recap, we're seeing a bit of a picture here. Cain, or sort of Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of this knowledge of good and evil. Cain then goes about, to, to, sits about to please God through the work of his hands and kills his brother and is cast out of the garden. Then he goes and builds a city. In this city uh, that he built, uh, this religious concept comes about where they can please God through their works. They worship God as the sun and the moon. And from this, Seven other, seven other cities developed that all have a similar Baal worshipping theology. So what we've seen that occur here, just in recap, Cain has come out, built this city, the city has been destroyed by the flood, rebuilt again by Nimrod, and the name of it now is called Erech, and this is all taking place. And then, out of this city, in 1921 BC, we see... Abraham is called out of the city to go and dwell with him. And God says he's going to build him a city. And God's city that he's building is what we are. We're the culmination of that. And then the Bible story follows this track here. So what we're looking at today, this is just a bit of the preamble, I guess, but the Bible story follows this line down here, just the, 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 the events surrounding the nation of Israel. And all of a sudden, in the book of Daniel, God all of, all of a sudden goes back and picks up the story of Earth left off here in prophecy and gives us an outline of what's going to happen with the world 
in we, that we're living in. Because all the way through the, the Old Testament of the scriptures, you read about the nation of Israel. And, and there are little bits where he talks about different nations and kings and so forth. But Daniel is really just giving us in prophecy an outline of what's happening in the rest of the world. Because God's not that interested in what's happening in the rest of the world. He's only interested in how it affects us. When I say us, I mean his children. So from the, this city here, developed this, eventually, an empire called Babylon. And that's where we pick up the story in Daniel. So that's what we're going to look at today. So these four beasts, you can see there the first one, the lion, the second, the bear, and the third, uh, looks like a, um, a leopard. And then the last one is a combination of those four. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions upon, uh, of his head upon his bed, and then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the, of the matters. Now we know that the first year of Belshazzar the king was 553 BC, long before these empires became empires. So Daniel had a dream, and Daniel spoke and, uh, and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Now when we talk about the Great Sea, what we're talking about there is the Mediterranean. So we're talking about these empires stemming from around the Mediterranean. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And these uh, great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So he said he's actually interpreting for us the meaning of these dreams. We don't have to try and apply it to this or that. Uh, Bible does that for us very well. So we see here that this, this dream, these four beasts represent four kings or kingdoms upon the earth. And when we look back in the history books, we see that from 612 to 539, we have this Babylonian Empire, stemming from the Mediterranean and encompassing all of the Holy Lands, going right down to here, and then eventually in 539 they were taken by the Medo-Persian Empire, they reigned until 331, and then came Alexander, the Grecian Empire. They then came there and came in very quickly and uh, took over the empire there and expanded it even further right up as far as India. And then eventually, in 168, came the Roman Empire. So in this small section of scripture, God is just covering a massive part of world history. Absolutely, he's talking about you know, four massive empires. In, in the scope of the world at that time. So we're just going to quickly look at each of those empires, the Babylonian Empire. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon its feet as a man, a man's heart was given to it. Notice here, you see this lion with um, wings. That was actually one of the big uh, monographs on the, on the walls there in Babylon. They were known for being this lion with eagle's wings. So it's apt that the Lord would uh, describe it in this fashion. Bearing in mind again, this dream occurred in um, 553 BC. So it's um, quite an interesting thing that uh, God would describe all these empires that would come in the next thousand years so detailed. Babylon was a great city of over a million people. Uh, we, know that, we know about it from the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. We're talking about a massive, self-sufficient city. The walls were absolutely huge, impenetrable. The towers where they would guard um, the city walls were so high that enemy arrows couldn't even um, reach as high as the, the towers. It had a river, the Euphrates River running through the middle of it. It had fields, it had agriculture, it had every resource inside the city. It could withstand a siege for as long as the siege could last, because they were completely self-sufficient. So quite, in, in, um, in its day, it was quite an unbelievable city. People would have went there in absolute awe when they walked through the gates, and they would never have thought that it would be able to fall. The Medes and the Persians. So we see here in verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and, uh, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, give our much flesh. 
So we know, we don't know later on we're going to talk about it, but uh, we know it's talking about the Medes and Persians, how that they came in and took Babylon. Quite an amazing concept that they would take Babylon in one day. And what they did was that they came in under, they dammed, put, built these causeways and dammed up the river Euphrates and came under the wall, under the wall. Quite an amazing thing that they would be able to do that. Raised up on one side, we know that Cyrus was stronger. Medes and the Persians were Cyrus and Darius. And we know that Cyrus was the more stronger of those um, kings. And three rifts talking about Lydia, Babylon and Egypt. These were the three kingdoms that they conquered. So at this stage, Egypt was a had been a massive power for a long time. And for them to conquer Egypt was quite an undertaking. And they did out much flesh. Um, in other words, they obtained much territory. So you can see here, that one sitting on the Tigris and Euphrates River, and as the Euphrates went through, they were just able to go into the wall. Now Cyrus, we read here, Cyrus by name, Cyrus the Great, was born in 590 BC. So, he was only just born when that prophecy was being given there by Daniel. And in the Bible, Cyrus was named as the liberator of the Jews. And this is what happened. He did actually come in there and allow the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple up and never get their back destroyed. This is where, this just sends chills down my spine when I read this. This is written in 690 BC. So 100 years before um, Cyrus was actually born. And 100 years, 140 years before it, these events actually occurred. It we read in Isaiah 44, Thus saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry out thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Though uh, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That is just an astounding prophecy, isn't it? In 690 BC, he's saying here several things. The river's going to be dried up, talking about Babylon, that Cyrus, who's naming here, before he's even born, Cyrus is going to be used by God, he's going to perform his pleasure, he's going to allow, thou shalt, uh, saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed yet. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. The temple hasn't been destroyed yet. This might be quite perplexing for Isaiah, writing this down, reading about this, that when... Uh, you know, how can you comprehend what he's written? What he's written? It's quite amazing. Next chapter, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, um, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall, uh, shall not be shut. I will go before thee to make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in thunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by name and the God of Israel. Uh, if Cyrus only knew that God had actually <laughs> said these words, it's quite amazing. Verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have called thee by name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. That, that to me is a quite an amazing prophecy. And really, um, just take a second just to consider these words here. This is just after these words are written, God makes a statement. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else, I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So, in the preceding two chapters, God has just outlined how He's going to use Cyrus to go in and destroy Babylon, was going to allow the temple to be rebuilt, allow the Jews to return back to Jerusalem again, and it's all there played out before us. Really, when we talk to people, I don't know why people don't respond to this. I think it's an amazing thing that deserves a considered answer. If you go to people and just show them the evidence, show them the encyclopedias, show them the Cyrus who was born in 590, 
took Jerusalem, uh, took Babylon in 539, and in 690 BC, the prophet Isaiah had dictated this is all going to happen. Only God can know that, that, that sort of thing. And this level of detail, detail is just it's outstanding. And then further, a little bit later, in the next chapter, Daniel actually goes into more detail. We read here, in the third year of the king, uh, the reign of the king Belshazzar, in a vision, appeared unto me. Uh, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at first. So he had it one earlier. In 553 he had a vision, and then two years later now he's having another vision. So the first one was in 553, which was a vision of the four beasts. Now, two years later, he's having another vision, but now he's having a vision, something a little bit different. I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which was in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Eula. Now, this is 12 years before the rise of the Medo Persian Empire. Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, behold, there stood before me a river and a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, the higher, uh, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now just remembering, remember how the bear was raised up on one side, how the Cyrus was the stronger? Now we see this depicted in the form of a ram with two horns, but one horn was bigger than the other. And, it's, uh, and I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could be delivered out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. What on earth are we talking about here? Well, when we talk about the higher came up last, the riot, for me, ended up controlling the empire. They did, in fact, move westward to Lydia, northward to Babylon, and southward to Egypt. And they became a great empire. So the specifics of this reign are captured and encapsulated in the movements and the succession of growth and expansion of the Medo Persian Empire. Now that's, you know, we are applying it that way, but is it true to say that, can we say that this reign represents an amazing version? Well, we read in Daniel chapter 8 verse 20, the ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The Lord could not possibly be clearer than that. So we have no uncertainty whatsoever that this Medo Persian Empire was going to move northward, southward, and westward, take these three kingdoms, and that one king would be greater than the other. Now the Grecian Empire. Now we're covering cover, you know, a lot of years here. After this I beheld and lower another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and um, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. But now a leopard. So we're, we're presuming now we're just talking about Alexander and the Grecian Empire. Because we can do this now looking backwards, with the hindsight of history. And as I was considering, behold, a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, the forces of Alexander the Great defeated the Persians at the Granicious River in Asia Minor in May 334. But we're talking now 220 years after the prophecy of the Bible. They would have known the Grecians were even an empire back then. They weren't an empire. So number one, he came from the west, <coughs> didn't touch the ground, and notable horn. So we see there, west of, of this area is Europe. Uh, and uh, unexampled rapidity of success. He just moved in so quickly that it was just amazing people. Mostly through his cavalry. That battle at the Granicious River was really a battle that was won because his cavalry was so well drilled in operating. And the Persians just couldn't take them. Notable horn, uh, the king of the exception, obviously about Alexander the Great. He conquered the Medes and Persians, he smoked the rise of Granatius Isis, controlled the territory all the way to India, and the great horn would be broken. In other words, Alexander would die at the height of his power. And that's exactly what happened. 
came, uh, and he came to the ram that had two horns, which had seen standing before the river and ran under him in the fury, in the fury of his power. So we're talking here about this one representing the Grecian Empire coming up and fighting against this ram that had two horns and beating him, which is exactly what happened. And I saw him come close to the ram and he moved with troll or anger against him and smote the ram and broke his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So how do we know that this is talking about the Grecian Empire? Because God goes for the just The very next verse after that other one where he told us who the one ram was, he tells us this rough goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is his first king. So the Bible is very explicit about the detail about who these people are. Why is this not something that we see on TV when people talk about the Bible? Could you get any better proof that the creator of the universe has given us events that shape the world we live in? The Western world we live in, live in now is totally shaped by this succession of world empires. And that was pre-told by God 220 years before he did. Therefore, the he gave back very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it, came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So the level of detail is just quite astounding. Four notable ones. So after Alexander died, four of his generals then took over the reign of that empire. So we're looking at Cassandra, Lysis, Lysis, I can't pronounce it, Lysimachus, uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And these, these four guys controlled the empire the ongoing until eventually in 168 and they were overrun by the Romans. So the Roman Empire. It's interesting also, is in the years before this, between uh, 168 going back to 331, that was what we thought was called the Hellenization of that area. So, and in that was all of the land of Judea had become Hellenized, so the Greek language was very prominent when Jesus came down. And one of the interesting aspects was that one of the reasons why the Romans actually got involved in it was because the people of the Jews that were there, that were so corrupt, they were trying to get the Romans to come in and fight against the Greeks to get them out so that they could have, have some power, which is, didn't fare well for them anyway. Now verse 7 of Daniel 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So it was a combination or a composite beast having the features of all of the previous. Which when you add them all up, it's interesting that it had seven heads, ten horns, and feet like a bear and body like a leopard and a head like a lion. And it's quite interesting when you think about this in terms of this story as it gets developed further in the book of Revelation, because this beast, if you can remember what it looks like, seven heads, ten horns, it's mentioned several times in the book of Revelation, so that we of no uncertain terms about what it's talking about. Because this Roman Empire, this fourth beast that took over from the, from the Greeks, it spanned all of this area here. So it went through a bit of a transformation to become this. Identical, just different names. We read in Revelation where the story then is picked up by John. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. There we have it. Seven heads, ten horns. So we know what it's talking about. We can go back into the Old Testament, find a beast mentioned with seven heads, ten horns, and find that it is the empire that rose up from the Grecian Empire. So we know he was talking about the Romans. I don't think John would have fared very well when he wrote the Roman Empire <laughs> when he was writing this. Wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have been very good in the papers to do. And upon his head horns were ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion, 
and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So now, this story has been developed even further, saying that this beast, that Roman Empire, was actually motivated by and given power by the dragon. We read uh, earlier, or sorry, later, that this dragon is the devil. And verse 3, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Anybody ever want to tell me what that means? That his wound was, that he was wounded, and he seemed to be dead, but not really? We'll see that next. Reading Revelation chapter 13, you sort of got to read Revelation 13 and 17 together, because you see here, that we're talking about the same beast. It says here, So he carried me away in spirit unto the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names and blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. So again we see the seven heads and ten horned beast. Again. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So we're looking here at, at somebody who's actually harnessed this empire and controlling the empire. And it's described as a woman having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. What on earth is that talking about? Well, we know that the ten horns represented ten kingdoms that arose. And the Roman Empire, when, when it was, um, became the Roman Empire, when it eventually fell, became ten kingdoms or ten nations. The Vandals, the Lombards, Alemanni, the French, the Visigoths, uh, the Romanians, the Barbarians, the Ostrogoths. It's just a, a quite a detailed description here. And in Revelation it talks about, rather than saying that this, had a, this beast had a wound that was deadly but it rose again, we see here it describes the beast in a different fashion. It says, The beast that you saw was and is not, and yet shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and when they shall behold the beast that was, that is not, and yet is. So this beast, it was the Roman Empire, but it wasn't the Roman Empire, but yet it really is. In other words, what it's talking about here is a transformation from being paid in Rome to paid in Rome, or the Holy Roman Empire. And that's what occurred. It's exactly what occurred back in 476. The Roman Empire was finished, seemingly dead, but out of the ashes of this Roman Empire came a new empire, the Holy Roman Empire that became much bigger, stronger, and more uh, wider spread than the Roman Empire could have ever imagined. And just to give us a clear um, indication of where we're talking about, and the, here is a mind which uh, has wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Where do we know that it's the city of seven hills? There's two cities on earth that are known as the city of seven hills. One is Rome, and one is Constantinople. Constantinople is also known as the city of seven hills. And also has seven mountains on earth. Which is interesting because you had the Eastern and Western Roman Empires, and one capital was at Constantinople, which originally was called Byzantium, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, which rose out of the Roman Empire. So it's interesting here what it's talking about. This head of government, this head of this... Um, this beast. These here are symbols from pagan Rome. This is actually Constantine here riding on his horse. And you'll notice here all of the sun rays. That all represents the pagan worship of the time, which was Baal worship, which was sun worship, worship of Apollo and the sun god. Now, when in 476 the Roman Empire was destroyed, um, at that time, all of the Christian um, apostles and, and so forth had been given all of the names of all the pagan gods and names and so forth had taken on Christian names. So all of a sudden, statues that used to be of Apollo now was Peter the Apostle. Same statue, same paraphernalia that went with it. And this is what, exactly what occurred. So all of the pagan religion of those empires. Just take a second just to think about this. Going right back to Cain, 
and then the establishment of a city that was worshiping the sun god, that was absolutely saturated with the sun god worship, going down to Babylon, and then the Medes and the Persians, and then the Grecians, and then the Romans, all absorbed this same kind of religious theology, which is a essentially a works-based concept, ethical humanism. The Medes and the Persians, when you read the uh, history of the Medes, Cyrus was a person who would be a great, he would be a, a, the Barack Obama of their day. He was a great speaker and he won people just by giving them great promises of affluence and prosperity. These people, we have this picture of these barbarians. They weren't always like that. Especially with Cyrus. He was quite a speaker and actually people were so sad when he died because they felt that he made life so much better. That is the symbol of sun god. That is the Baal altar. And immediately when we think of Baal, we think of, you know, back in the days of Elijah the prophet. That there is the Vatican from space. The Vatican from space looks like a massive big Baal altar. That is the symbol of Baal worship. The rays of the sun emanating from this circular one here. So this thing here, when it, it, we're going to see later, I've got a lot more images of Baal worshiping, but essentially, essentially you'll see that all the Baal statues from 2000, 3000 BC, 1900 BC, in Israel from you know, 600 BC, all look like that. If you lay them down and look at them flat down, that's what they look like. And that's a tragedy, isn't it? Here is a statue of a sun god, high priest, from 2100 BC. I'm not sure if you can see that clearly here, but I've shown you here. Along the hem of his dress, all the sun rays, just like the Pope has. His hat, with the bit hanging down the back here, just like the Pope's crown, with the bit hanging down. Here, with the sun, just there, just like on the hat that the Pope wears. On his arm, he has this here, this uh, sun rays on his wrist, representing the sun god. And here you have this cross around his necklace, and he's got all over him, the same cross. We know it was the Maltese cross. Again, you see the the Baal symbol all over the place. Within you can go down to into Wollongong and go to any Catholic church with this and go and see it all over the... You see it everywhere. It's quite amazing. It absolutely saturates all of the churches. And Church of England isn't, <laughs> isn't you know, uh, any different. You go there and you see it similarly. Here's an old statue of the high priest of Baal worship, as it was in those cities that Nimrod built, those seven cities of Babylon. And you see here the Pope with the sun on his wrist, just like him. You can see the cross, the same, and all the other stuff. I don't need to go into it, but... They didn't have digital photography back in those days, but if you could take a photo of a vile priest from back in those days, I don't think you'd distinguish it that far removed from what the modern day types look like. The reason I brought up the story of Elijah, back in the story of Elijah, it says, Now therefore send and gather me uh, gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel. So I was talking about all these prophets of Baal who eat at Jezebel's table. In the New Testament, in Revelation, it says, talking about the church of Thyatira, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, and teaches to seduce and my servants to commit a fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So in the book of Revelation, we see this picked up again, this story of this Jezebel-dominated theology that causes people to find themselves, without knowing it, worshipping Baal. Tragic. And not just her, but also all the other religions jump in bed with her. This sort of thing is what all of the reformers identified. This is why the Reformation is there. 
So just to recap, Rewind the 13, and they worship. This is talking about all the people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit. And they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like to the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for 40 and 2 months. So it actually gives a specific time frame of how long this was going to go for. And just coincidentally, 42 months works out to be 1260 days. You add them up, in the Old Testament calendar, 30 days to a month. 12 months is 360 days. And 360 days is the average of the lunar and solar calendar. You combine them both together, average them out, you get exactly 360. So 12 months is 1260, sorry, um, 42 months is 1260 days. So when we look at when this beast was established, we realise that 606 AD was when the Holy Roman Empire was established. 1260 years later, 1866. That's when we find it's going to come to an end. This is just a bit of a graphic just to display that. And again, just like elsewhere in the scriptures, other, other prophecies all tied with it. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which began in the early church, there was going to be a drought, like the drought of Elijah's time, that would last for three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days, until eventually a ladder ran in your coinciding with the, this beast being finished. And this is just a graphic just to help us understand 1260 and how we do it. Um, it's fairly easy, and I'm not going to stick on it too long, but. Uh, we can see from Revelation 12 to 1260 and time storm and half time and 42 months are all talking about the same time frame. Just as evidence that 606 is our beginning date, 606 AD was when Boniface the third opened the issue of the title Universal Epicopus, which means Roman Catholic Church or Universal Church. So that's when it began, 606. And it went right through until eventually. 1866, when Garibaldi marched into Italy and liberated the, uh, the nation of Italy from the, the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope was confined to the Vatican. This year is from the Encyclopedia. In December of 1866, the last of the French troops departed from Rome in spite of the efforts of the Pope to retain them. By the withdrawal, Italy was free from the presence of foreign soldiers for the first time in probably a thousand years. Pretty emphatic, isn't it? Exactly what occurred, exactly as God said that it would occur. So, what we've seen today is really from 612 BC going right through to now. We're talking about a thousand years of history that has formed the world we live in. And this is why most of the world religions, when I say most, I mean 99% of them, of the world religions, find themselves in one way or another. Worshipping the sun and the moon. And you just got to look at what they're doing to see that that's occurring. Look at the Muslims with all of the crescent moon over everything. Everything, all of their worship, all of their ceremony is all surrounding the, the rotation around the moon, around the sun. All of the Catholicism and the, the Orthodox religion today is really just the same thing. People want a religion where it's just you're a good bloke, you go to heaven, you're a bad bloke, you go to hell. That has nothing to do with the grace of God and nothing to do with the Bible. Nothing whatsoever. It's a construct of human, ethical human. If you ask the bloke across the road, he just wants to be left to his own, and you know, what he determines is a good bloke, then that's a good bloke. Whereas the Bible standard is, we've got to be sitting at the Lord's table. There's no other else. There's the Lord's table, and that is it. And the only people that sit at the Lord's table are people who are filled with the Holy Ghost. As far as the rest goes, the Bible says that they'll be judged by their works. And the Bible also says that they'll reap what they sow. So most people in this world, unfortunately, believe that they'll be judged by their works. And according to their own opinion, they think, well, I'm a good bloke, you know, when I borrow my lawnmower, I'll take it back at the right time and everything. I'm a decent bloke, I'll be okay. And the expectation is, I'll be judged by my works and I'll be okay. And that's what they'll reap. They'll reap judgment of their works. And what happens with those people is really not our area. Our area is the preaching of the gospel and the preaching of the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. 
so that we can actually be filled like that. And the end, that stone that smoked the image in chapter 2 of Daniel, that eventually uh, is going to become a great kingdom and fill the whole earth. We're talking now about the church. So I think I'll just leave it there. I know it's a lot to take in, but it's really quite an amazing set of prophecies that just outline history before it ever happened. And the more you get into the details, the more amazing it is. The story of Elijah itself would take a couple of days for us to get through. It's just an amazing story. If you don't know, Elijah pronounces there's going to be a drought. And the drought would last for three and a half years, which is exactly 1260 days. A day in prophecy is like a thousand, oh sorry, a, thousand years. A, a, a day is like a year. So 1260 years, Elijah was talking about a drought that would last that long. A spiritual drought. We sang that song earlier. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit like rain. It's the same thing. Elijah was pronouncing that because of these prophets of Baal coming in, there was going to be a drought for 1260 years. But then there was going to be a massive outpouring. And that's what we're witnessing now. We're seeing people come out of the churches, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, realising that the tradition and the religion is not of God. And that's what we need to tell people and let them know about. Amen. Amen.